Did you know that more than half of counselors in substance use disorders programs have or will personally experience some form of violence in the workplace? This is according to a 2015 study by Bride et al. For this episode, let's discuss why this is and how counselors in all areas can and should prepare for these dangerous situations. Hello there, this is Bradley, and you're listening to Psych Everywhere, a podcast by Psychi, the International Honor Society in Psychology. For this show, distinguished guests weigh in on applying psychological science to a diverse range of current events and to better your life. Would you prefer to read along as you listen? A written transcript is available. See the link in the show notes for this episode. Joining us for our conversation today is Dr. Julie Kostopoulos, full professor at Florida Tech. She previously served as a senior forensic psychologist for the Sexually Violent Predator Program of Florida. There, she received several awards for her work. She's taught numerous courses in forensic psychology, and she's conducted many studies as well. This includes a study that's nearing completion which evaluates the role of graduate programs in preparing students for the risks for forensic settings. I was looking at the SEPA Convention Online Program and I stumbled upon a workshop there about clinician safety, prevention, and management of violence by Dr. Kostopoulos. And I couldn't even attend that convention myself but I immediately wanted to know more, and so I added to the list for future episodes on the show. So I don't think Sakai's ever really had this conversation before, and it's certainly a very important topic to discuss. So Dr. Kostopoulos, I'm really excited to welcome you to Psych Everywhere. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Wow. Um, so more than half are going to experience some form of violence I hadn't really heard that, and I've been with Psychi and around psychologists for the you know the past ten years. Am I the only person that's really shocked to hear it? Is that is that typical of how I'm feeling when I heard that? I think a lot of people are surprised, and um, even people who work in these settings become complacent and mm-hmm. uh, forget that they can be dangerous settings. I wondered also, how likely is it for other types of counselors, you know, marriage counselors, um, to experience some form of violence as well? Are are there any statistics on that? Uh, Yes. So it's more common in some settings. And um, part of the issue is that even settings where we are intentionally working with dangerous clients, you may have one attempt or threat after thousands of non-threatening interactions. And so even the people intentionally working in dangerous settings are lulled into complacency and, and underestimate how risky it is. But here are some statistics. 30 to 40 percent of psychologists in private practice have experienced an assault by a patient in their care. 25% of mental health staff in inpatient facilities report being assaulted and 43% report being threatened. And the majority of assaults occurring in inpatient settings are against staff, not other patients. And the uh, 2015 Bride study you mentioned found that there are certain settings and populations at greater risk. That includes uh, clinicians working with substance abusers, clinicians working with children and adolescents, and then, as you might imagine, those working in the criminal justice system like I do. I mean, people love crime. They love forensic psychology. Why do you think, I mean, you said from a clinician's perspective, they go, you know, a thousand good cases before they have a bad one, but I go a thousand days before I have a crime, and yet I I find myself wanting to watch crime on the TV all the time. Is There's some reason why we don't talk about this? Is this too close to home or? or... Is there a reason we don't talk about clinicians experiencing? Yeah. That's a a great question. I don't know that that there's been research on it, uh, but 
my thoughts on why we maybe don't talk about these events happening is because they're scary. We prefer to think about ourselves being in safe settings and uh, taking all the right steps. And if you do look at research on uh, victim blaming and attribution, we do tend to assume that someone who's been victimized was in some way responsible. And that makes us feel more powerful and safer. And so I think um, that some of that might even explain why assaults in mental health settings are underreported. So to be clear, uh, what kinds of violence are we talking about? This is obviously beyond verbal. Yes, the research on this is everything from homicide to robbing a person. So there's been uh, research from the Bureau of Justice Statistics on fatal and non-fatal workplace physical violence. And they found that of healthcare settings, mental health and forensic settings have the highest physical violence rates, while they found law enforcement had the highest workplace violence, as you might imagine, that was directly followed by mental health occupations in second place. Um, So I think if you want to talk about the larger idea of verbal assaults as well, um, then those numbers are even higher. So if you want to talk about threats, uh, one older study found that 81% of therapists reported either verbal abuse formal harassment from their patients or a physical attack. Wow. So we could totally skip this next question if you'd like, but I wondered if you had ever experienced any violence in the workplace? Absolutely. Um, I come to this area of um, education not because I was perfectly trained and avoided risk. I want to share what I've learned from making many mistakes. Frankly, um, I feel very fortunate that I've gotten safely out of some situations that could have been a lot worse. Uh, So, for example, I've witnessed assaults uh, against staff and against other patients. I've provided aid to people who've been assaulted, and I've gotten involved by trying to de-escalate the person who was doing the assault or threatening Mm -hmm. And um, then I've had uh, personally an experience of being threatened uh, with the real belief that it could be carried out. So I'll tell you that story if you have a second. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, Okay. So um, I was working with a serial killer who had committed his um, his homicides physically. He did not use a weapon. He used his body Mm. and um, he became very angry with me and uh, was threatening me and the ward staff intervened and through their efforts to de-escalate him he redirected his anger into property damage he was continuing to threaten me while he was doing it but rather than harming me he uh, harmed the property around him Mm -hmm. and uh, that was certainly a wake-up call to realize how dangerous some of the work I do can be and how much I need to think through effective escape strategies and de-escalation strategies uh, when things get to that crisis level. Yeah, I was going to say, is that what brought you to teaching workshops on this topic? Um, Certainly witnessing it, uh, Uh even when uh, my own experience, of course, makes me know it's a real risk to everyone. But also witnessing people be harmed um, and thinking through what we need to be teaching our students. Uh, I feel a responsibility to my students that I'm sending into these settings. Mm -hmm. And so what we need to be teaching them to be safe is really important to me. In what ways are counselors typically trained to handle clients who could become violent? Or are, are some of them not trained at all? Uh, This I find shocking, um, but true. But even students with an interest in forensic work are rarely trained in safety or conflict resolution. Uh, One study found that only 25 percent of clinicians who are working in forensic settings received any formal training in their graduate program uh, on workplace violence risk or conflict resolution and safety training. So it's rarely in their 
academic curriculum. And it's rarely in their workplace training unless their job specifically requires that they employ restraints. So if they don't actually formally take the role of restraining a person, they're often not trained. So what kinds of training would you recommend? Are there places they can go for this? Yes, this is a a real need in our field, Uh and it clearly needs to be incorporated into curriculum and workplace training. So I think uh, mitigating risk is a component of cultural competence to work in any mental health care setting. And that's the way I think it should be wrapped into curriculum. Uh, I've completed a survey of supervisors in forensic settings and the training they recommend and the the steps that they recommend clinicians engage in is being uh, trained to be aware of the system's protections for movement and your schedule. So making sure you're checking in and you're making people aware of your location, Um, being trained on the setting and particularly the safety uh, of the physical setting in the room you're going to be using. Avoiding being complacent with offenders, so remaining skeptical and remembering to stay up to date on recent threats or actions that are questionable so you don't forget that someone that is polite to you is also quite dangerous. And um, monitoring your needs and boundaries, and that can be useful in being attentive to other people's cues and cues you may be sending out that could mislead someone that you're working with. Um, And then, of course, specific training on interpersonal skills and de-escalation techniques. Well, that's that's my next question. Um, De-escalation. Do you have any tips for de-escalating a situation with what appears to be an aggressive or dangerous client? Yes, I I do. I'll say that, first of all, there are a lot of really great de-escalation models. So you can find one that fits with your way of thinking or your personality or your interpersonal strengths. Um, And then I I have a particular model of the way I think about it. Um, But I just want to say that there are a lot of great models out there that that you could read on. um, And I'd be happy to provide you a short list. Absolutely. And we'll include um, a link to that in the show notes. Great. Okay. Um, I like to think of it, uh, anger as a balloon, right? So I think of it as Uh, a person as they build anger, sort of the tension uh, around them becomes thinner and thinner. So they can tolerate less and less as that balloon blows up. And in the way I see them, you either have to convince them to let some of that air out. You have to sneak some of it out, whether they're in agreement or not, or you need to get away from it so that if it blows, Mm -hmm. the fray doesn't hit you. So I think of that as four different options. Um, One of them to sort of convince them to let the air out is uh, joining. And that de-escalation attempt would be using empathy and reflection and restatement to sort of help them to let go of some of the intensity of their emotion and be calming. Um, The next one is sort of pushing towards the balloon from the outside, creating structure. And that can mean sometimes a very parental role of scolding and saying your behavior is inappropriate. This is what you need to do Hmm. or making them aware of the consequences of their choices so they can choose to, to calm themselves and gain greater control. Um, Another is uh, this is the sort of sneaky one is diffusing or distracting them. So Hmm. using humor, changing the target, uh, distracting them into some other event going on, helping them to tap into other emotions to give that anger a chance to dissipate a bit. And then lastly, flee, uh, which is get help and get out before it blows. Um, And I think that's, you know, not necessarily de-escalating them, but it de-escalates the harm that they can um, impose on others. I have a hard time being funny in the best of situations. I can't imagine (laughs) trying to be humorous. At a time like this. You know, uh, that's a great point. But sometimes, <laughs> <Maybe it> comes... 
<laughs> well, sometimes you have enough rapport with a client that you can point something out and you can distract them and start to lead them to gaining a little perspective and a little humor in the situation. Um, and uh, obviously you have to have some relationship with them to get them to see the humor in a bad situation, but sometimes it can work. What kind of boundaries should you set with clients? I guess I'm thinking physical space, but maybe more than that too. Yeah, I would say uh, I have some specific thoughts on physical boundaries, but also on psychological boundaries. Mm -hmm. For for physical boundaries, um, the first is of course access to the door and removal of weapons. So I think um, remembering the way in which you need to set your setting up for safety whenever you're meeting with a client is really important and not very many people think about that. And then psychologically, having good boundaries and a professional role is very helpful for professional safety. One of our forensic experts noted that unwanted sexual attention led to safety issues. And we have to understand that our professional role can protect us from boundary violations and other unwanted emotional reactions to ourselves uh, by our clients. So some of that means monitoring your own emotional needs, managing the way you present yourself to clients so that you aren't inviting boundary violations and maintaining your strong professionalism to avoid confusing them about their role or what is appropriate behavior and in interactions with you. Um, are there any changes that you should make to your environment um, when dealing with someone who might become dangerous? Absolutely. I was just at graduation and a student who uh, is on her doctoral internship told me that the way the room for her internship work was set up was wrong and she had mm -hmm. to advocate for herself in this secure setting. Uh, to rearrange the space so that she felt uh, less at risk. So some of my recommendations are to be sure someone knows where you are and how long you should be there so that you know someone will come looking for you if you don't come out of your room. Mm -hmm. Make sure you aren't alone and you can be heard on your wing of the building or you know in your suite of offices. Um, arrange the physical safety of your room. So make sure you have an easy escape. There should not be an obstacle between you and the door. Uh, rooms are often not set up this way, but clinicians should be closest to the door and clients should be farther away so you can get out if you're in a dangerous situation. And there should not be any projectiles available for them to throw at you. Uh, and that means you don't keep the stapler on top of your desk, you store it in a drawer um, no decorative marble balls or uh, bookends that mm -hmm. could easily be grabbed and thrown. And then um, just two more tips I would include. Uh, think about your attire and your demeanor, particularly if you're working with uh, insecure settings with more dangerous population. Um, you may need to project authority in order to establish the right professional boundaries and be ready to to use your game face when you need it. Um, and then settings really need to be set up with panic buttons. And this is applicable to clinicians in any setting. There are panic buttons that run like $20 that have a speaker phone that directly connects only to 911. And having a, a button with a battery in it for $20 is such a simple solution. I don't think anybody should have an office that doesn't have that option. So this next question is a little scary to think about, even, I think. I, I'm not a psychologist, but even for me, this makes me a bit nervous to think about this scenario. Uh, so if a client aggressively comes across your desk at you, what then? What do you do? It's a great question. One of the reasons it's a great question is because if we can make ourselves think through these scenarios in advance, we're much more likely to do something effective if it does happen. We're not shocked. We've created the mental frame where we would know what to do. So this is a great question. And let's just talk about, I would do it in three steps. The first step is as they were, you know, touching your desk, uh, assess the threat. What could be used as a weapon? That stapler, um, 
you know, uh, a framed photo, whatever it is, get it out of the way. That's that's the first thing. Um, it should have been removed beforehand. But in that moment, you know, things happen. There's your bottle of water. You need to move it. The second is to avoid staying isolated. So even as you're beginning to de-escalate them, which we'll talk about next, you should be moving your body towards the door or your panic button should be pressed. Even if you aren't going to end up needing to call for emergency services, the process needs to begin as soon as you feel threatened. Um, mm -hmm. There's an interesting book called The Gift of Fear that we tend to minimize and try to ignore our threat because we don't want to believe it's real. Uh, you should resist that and begin moving towards safety as soon as you feel unsafe, regardless of whether it continues to escalate. And then lastly, use your skills. Begin de-escalating them. Immediately start you know, choose your path. Are you going to say, I see you're very angry. I'm sorry that you're feeling that way and join with them and empathize with them. Or are you going to say the appropriate behavior now is to sit down? I need you to take your seat. Are, are you going to push back? Are you going to join? Are you mm -hmm. going to try to redirect and, and or are you going to flee? Choose your choose your path and start to use it as you're moving towards safety, which is an exit. If a counselor does experience workplace violence, uh, maybe even an assault, how might they, that change their job performance and their behavior moving forward? Well, this is a, a real problem in our field. It impacts burnout and high rates of burnout are related to physical health deteriorating, lack of job satisfaction, turnover and absenteeism at work. So it will rob you of some of the joy in the work that you've trained so hard to do. But we've also found that in forensic clinicians, if you have experienced threats or assaults, it affects your own ability to fairly and accurately identify risk levels in your clients. And so if that's your critical job duty is evaluating risk, um, it can impact your beliefs regarding their dangerousness, uh, your personal safety and uh, their perceived uh, threat. So it can affect not only whether you want to do your job, but also how well you can do it. At what point would you recommend just ending a client relationship? Or in some cases, is that even really an option, I guess? Um, you know, raised voices, verbal threats, or just indications of past violence? That's a great question because it really does depend on the setting and your inherent safety protocols. The majority of people I evaluate have past violence, um, but the mm -hmm. setting I'm in means that even if they threaten me, I'm going to have a safe experience. Uh, so for me, I probably would continue treating someone in a forensic setting with safety protocols, even with threats of violence. Um, but some work would need to be done uh, to manage that, to manage the threat. Um, and it, again, it would depend on the level of security, even within the forensic setting that they were at. Um, but if you are in a private practice or maybe an outpatient treatment facility, that rupture of your relationship uh, may be fatal to your ability to have a therapeutic alliance. So there's been a study of uh, therapists who were assaulted, and they found that most of them were unable to repair the rupture, and they needed to terminate in order to have that client continue to work effectively with someone else. So most were not able to. Um, but another study uh, from 2018 looked at those who did fix the relationship after a rupture. And actually, they if they were able to address it, they were uh, able to accomplish some pretty positive outcomes in therapy. Mm. So that study recommended um, that therapists accept their role in causing a rupture in the alliance and then examining it uh, and really exploring it as part of their therapeutic process in order to avoid future hostility lingering um, during those settings and becoming dangerous. So it can be continued, but it can also be terminated, of course. You mentioned that a lot of the people you work with do have violent pasts, but 
for everyone else or, or, or even people who are in family and marriage and things like that, do you have any suggestions for how to screen clients for potential violence even before you even you know, get started with them? Yes, there are some great tools out there. Uh, one of them is the HCR20 for use in healthcare settings. Um, and that could be incorporated as part of an intake, um, getting information about the uh, different factors the HCR20 incorporates, but also doing your due diligence in your intake to look for some of the warning signs of people who become aggressive. Um, so there are a couple of studies that listed some of the most common warning signs for violence that I thought I would just mention briefly. Mm -hmm. um, so hostility and suspiciousness or a psychotic belief that others want to harm them is associated with violent acting out. And another study, a meta-analysis of inpatient violence looked at previous episodes of violence, impulsivity and hostility. Um, of course, those with non-voluntary admission to a psychiatric facility all had greater harm. And specifically in studies of outside of these settings in private practice, reporting to the therapist a displeasure in your therapy or showing direct hostility and criticism of your therapist um, is a sign that that client may become violent. Um, but what I think is also interesting is uh, they found in a psychiatric facility that harmony among staff and having a good work climate was actually effective in preventing aggression. So looking for also some of those preventative um, collaborations and uh, partnerships among staff can help keep you safe as well. Well, my goal here, and I think yours too, is certainly not to s frighten people away from these jobs. Um, they're important jobs, but rather to help them to be able to do them successfully and safely. You know, we have a responsibility, I think is the word you used earlier, for the people that we're mentoring and bringing into these careers. Um, so I don't know if now is the time to, to ask this or not, but do you have any tips to help students get involved in forensic psychology? Sure. It's a great field. Um, there's a lot of work both in the courts, in police agencies, in research related to legal decision making and the most effective treatment. I think an important piece of forensic psychology is recognizing risk and mm -hmm. not using that to turn away or run from the field, but using that to motivate your research and your clinical work so that it is managed properly. So I don't think it should scare people away. I think there's so much good work to be done to manage risk and uh, identify it and remain vigilant so that you and other clinicians can stay safe. Well, I really want to thank you so much for taking the time today. I've been really looking forward to this conversation for a long time now. I I saw this when you spoke at SEPA. That was last spring, right? And yes. uh, but I had a paternity leave and things got behind in my life. And uh, but the whole time through, I've been thinking I'm going to get back to that topic. <laughs> well, congratulations on your leave we, on your paternity. We did leave. it. <laughs> oh, thank you. I would love to have you back on the show again, and we'll talk more about forensic psychology specifically and and ways to get involved in that and some of the interesting things that people have seen in this field. I, oh, yeah. I know there's definitely a demand for that. So, Yeah, and I think, you know, so the way I conceptualize our program, we have like a law enforcement focus, we have a courtroom victimology, mm -hmm. a jury consulting focus, and then we have my area, which is more... Um, like adjudication of insanity, competency, and treatment of offenders focus. So um, we have different faculty for all the areas, and I'd, I'd be happy to sort of lay it out for them and then talk about my area if that would work for you, or we could bring oh. in others. Awesome. No, I think that sounds great. <laughs> It'd be fun. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. Okay. Yeah. Well, I've had a great time, and I really appreciate this, and uh, we'll sure. stay in touch, and hopefully we can do this again sometime. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you. You've just listened to another episode of Psych Everywhere. 
If you enjoyed this episode, take a moment to view Psychi's new mental health awareness online resource. We have a growing number of educational articles and content related to mental health. There, you'll also find ideas to take action in supporting mental health. I'll put a link in the show notes for all who are interested. If you haven't already subscribed to Psych Everywhere, go ahead and follow us wherever you go for podcasts. Tell a friend or a colleague about the show. Word of mouth is a huge help for podcasts. So share what you learned at the dinner table or in your classes. You can also follow us on Twitter at Psychi Podcast and leave a review at Apple Podcast or wherever you go for podcast. You'll absolutely make my day. And more importantly, you'll be helping us to get psych everywhere. Okay, that's all for now. I'll connect with you again soon. Copyright 2023, Psychi, the International Honor Society in Psychology. All rights reserved.